Chapter 17 Pipala Leaf Beneath the Pipala tree, the hermit Gautama focused all of his formidable powers of concentration to look deeply at his body. He saw that each cell of his body was like a drop of water in an endlessly flowing river of birth, existence and death. And he could not find anything in the body that remained unchanged or that could be said to contain a separate self. Intermingled with the river of his body was the river of feelings in which every feeling was a drop of water. These drops also jostled with one another in a process of birth, existence and death. Some feelings were pleasant, some unpleasant and some neutral. But all of his feelings were impermanent. They appeared and disappeared, just like the cells of his body. With his great concentration, Gautama next explored the river of perceptions, which flowed alongside the rivers of body and feelings. The drops in the river of perceptions intermingled and influenced each other in their process of birth, existence and death. If one's perceptions were accurate, reality revealed itself with ease. But if one's perceptions were erroneous, reality was veiled. People were caught in endless suffering because of their erroneous perceptions. They believed that that which is impermanent is permanent. That which is without self contains self. That which has no birth and death has birth and death. And they divided that which is inseparable into parts. Gautama next shone his awareness on the mental stage, states, which were the sources of suffering, fear, anger, hatred, ignorance, jealousy, greed, and arrogance. Mindful awareness blazed in him like a bright sun, and he used that sun of awareness to illuminate the nature of all these negative mental states. He saw that they all arose due to ignorance, they were the opposite of mindfulness. They were darkness, the absence of light. He saw that the key to liberation would be to break through ignorance and to enter deeply into the heart of reality and attain a direct experience of it. Such knowledge would not be the knowledge of the intellect, but of direct experience. In the past, Siddhartha had looked for ways to vanquish fear, anger and greed, but the methods he had used had not borne fruit because they were only attempts to suppress such feelings and emotions. Siddhartha now understood that their cause was ignorance and that when one was liberated from ignorance, mental obstructions would vanish on their own, like shadows fleeing before the rising sun. Siddhartha's insight was the fruit of his deep concentration. He smiled and looked up at a pipala leaf imprinted against the blue sky, its tail blowing back and forth as if calling him. Looking deeply at the leaf, he saw clearly the presence of the sun and stars. Without the sun, without light and warmth, the leaf could not exist. This was like this, because that was like that. He also saw in the leaf the presence of clouds. Without clouds there would be no rain, and without rain the leaf could not be. He saw the earth, time, space and mind. All were present in the leaf. In fact, at that very moment, the entire universe existed in that leaf. 
the reality of the leaf was a wondrous miracle. Though we ordinarily think that a leaf is born in the springtime, Gautama could see that it had been there for a long, long time in the sunlight, the clouds, the tree, and in himself. Seeing that the leaf had never been born, he could see that he too had never been born. Both the leaf and he had simply manifested. They had never been born and were incapable of ever dying. With this insight, ideas of birth and death, appearance and disappearance dissolved, and the true face of the leaf and his own true face revealed themselves. He could see that the presence of any one phenomenon made possible the existence of all other phenomena. One included all and all were contained in one. The leaf and his body were one, neither possessed a separate, permanent self, neither could exist independently from the rest of the universe. Seeing the interdependent nature of all phenomena, Siddhartha saw the empty nature of all phenomena, that all things are empty of a separate, isolated self, he realised that the key to liberation lay in these two principles of interdependence and non-self. Clouds drifted across the sky, forming a white background to the translucent pipala leaf. Perhaps that evening the clouds would encounter a cold front and transform into rain. Clouds were one manifestation Rain was another. Clouds also were not born and would not die. If the clouds understood that, Gautama thought, surely they would sing joyfully as they fell down as rain on the mountains, forests and rice fields. Illuminating the rivers of his body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness, Siddhartha now understood that impermanence and emptiness of self are the very conditions necessary for life. Without impermanence and emptiness of self, nothing could grow or develop. If a grain of rice did not have the nature of impermanence and emptiness, it could not grow into a rice plant. If clouds were not empty of self and impermanent, they could not transform into rain. Without an impermanent, non-self nature, a child could never grow into an adult. Thus, he thought, to accept life means to accept impermanence and emptiness of self. The source of suffering is a false belief in permanence and the existence of separate selves. Seeing this, one understands that there is neither birth nor death, production nor destruction, one nor many, inner nor outer, large nor small, impure nor pure. All such concepts are false distinctions created by the intellect. If one penetrates into the empty nature of all things, one will transcend all mental barriers and be liberated from the cycle of suffering. From one night to the next, Gautama meditated beneath the pipala tree, shining the light of his awareness on his body, his mind and all the universe. His five companions had long abandoned him and his co-practitioners were now the forest, the river, the birds, and the thousands of insects living on the earth and in the trees. The great pipala tree was his brother in practice. The evening star which appeared as he sat down in meditation each night was also his brother in practice. He meditated far into the night. The village children came to visit him only in the, in the early afternoons. One day, 
Sujata brought him an offering of rice porridge cooked with milk and honey, and Svasti brought him a fresh armful of kusa grass. After Svasti left to lead the buffaloes home, Gautama was seized with a deep feeling that he would attain the great awakening that very night. Only the previous night he had had several unusual dreams. In one, he saw himself lying on his side, his knees brushing against the Himalayas, his left hand touching the shores of the Eastern Sea, his right hand touching the shores of the Western Sea, and his two feet resting against the shores of the Southern Sea. In another dream, a great lotus as large as a carriage wheel grew from his navel and floated up to touch the highest clouds. In a third dream, birds of all colours, too many to be counted, flew towards him from all directions. These dreams seemed to announce that his great awakening was at hand. Early that evening, Gautama did walking meditation along the banks of the river. He waded into the water and bathed. When twilight descended, he returned to sit beneath his familiar pipala tree. He smiled as he looked at the newly spread kusa grass at the foot of the tree. Beneath this very tree, he had already made so many important discoveries in his meditation. Now the moment he had long awaited was approaching. The door to enlightenment was about to open. Slowly, Siddhartha sat down in the lotus position. He looked at the river flowing quietly in the distance as soft breezes rustled the grasses along its banks. The night forest was tranquil, yet very much alive. Around him chirped a thousand different insects. He turned his awareness to his breath and lightly closed his eyes. The evening star appeared in the sky. Chapter 18 The Morning Star Has Risen Through mindfulness, Siddhartha's mind, body and breath were perfectly at one. His practice of mindfulness had enabled him to build great powers of concentration, which he could now use to shine awareness on his mind and body. After deeply entering meditation, he began to discern the, sp the presence of countless other beings in his own body right in the present moment. Organic and inorganic beings, minerals, mosses and grasses, insects, animals and people were all within him. He saw that other beings were him right in the present moment. He saw his own past lives, all his births and deaths. He saw the creation and destruction of thousands of worlds and thousands of stars. He felt all the joys and sorrows of every living being, those born of mothers, those born of eggs, and those born of fission, who divided themselves into new creatures. He saw that every cell of his body contained all of heaven and earth and spanned the three times, past, present and future. It was the hour of the first watch of the night. Gautama entered even more deeply into meditation. He saw how countless worlds arose and fell, were created and destroyed he saw how countless beings pass through countless births and deaths. He saw that these births and deaths were but outward appearances and not true reality, 
just as millions of waves rise and fall incessantly on the surface of the sea, while the sea itself is beyond birth and death. If the waves understood that they themselves were water, they would transcend birth and death and arrive at true inner peace, overcoming all fear. This realization enabled Gautama to transcend the net of birth and death, and he smiled. His smile was like a flower blossoming in the deep night, which radiated a halo of light. It was the smile of a wondrous understanding, the insight into the destruction of all defilements. He attained this level of understanding by the second watch. At just that moment, thunder crashed and great bolts of lightning flashed across the sky as if to rip the heavens in two. Black clouds concealed the moon and stars. Rain poured down. Gautama was soaking wet, but he did not budge. He continued his meditation. Without wavering, he shined his awareness on his mind. He saw that living beings suffer because they do not understand that they share one common ground with all beings. Ignorance gives rise to a multitude of sorrows, confusions and troubles. Greed, anger, arrogance, doubt, jealousy and fear all have their roots in ignorance. When we learn to calm our minds in order to look deeply at the true nature of things, we can arrive at full understanding which dissolves every sorrow and anxiety and gives rise to acceptance and love. Gautama now saw that understanding and love are one. Without understanding, there can be no love. Each person's disposition is the result of physical, emotional and social conditions. When we understand this, we cannot hate even a person who behaves cruelly but we can strive to help transform his physical, emotional and social conditions. Understanding gives rise to compassion and love, which in turn give rise to correct action. In order to love, it is first necessary to understand. So understanding is the key to liberation. In order to attain clear understanding, it is necessary to live mindfully, making direct contact with life in the present moment, truly seeing what is taking place within and outside of oneself. Practicing mindfulness strengthens the ability to look deeply. And when we look deeply into the heart of anything, it will reveal itself. This is the secret treasure of mindfulness it leads to the realization of liberation and enlightenment. Life is illuminated by right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Siddhartha called this the noble path. Ayamaga. Looking deeply into the heart of all beings, Siddhartha attained insight into everyone's minds, no matter where they were, and he was able to hear everyone's cries of both suffering and joy. He attained to the states of divine sight, divine hearing, and the ability to travel across all distances without moving. It was now the end of the third watch, and there was no more thunder. The clouds roared back to reveal the bright moon and stars.
Gautama felt as though a prison which had confined him for thousands of lifetimes had broken open. Ignorance had been the jailkeeper. Because of ignorance, his mind had been obscured, just like the moon and stars hidden by the storm clouds, clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts the mind had falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and others, existence and non-existence, birth and death. And from these discriminations arose wrong views. The prisons of feelings, craving, grasping and becoming. The suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death only made the prison walls thicker. The only thing to do was to seize the jailkeeper and to see his true face. The jailkeeper was ignorance and the means to overcome ignorance were the noble eightfold path. Once the jailkeeper was gone, the jail would disappear and never be rebuilt again. The hermit Gautama smiled and whispered to himself, O oh, jailer, I see you now. How many lifetimes have you confined me in the prisons of birth and death? But now I see your face clearly, and from now on you can build no more prisons around me. Looking up, Siddhartha saw the morning star appear on the horizon, twinkling like a huge diamond. He had seen this star so many times before while sitting beneath the pipala tree. But this morning, it was like seeing it for the first time. It was as dazzling as the jubilant smile of enlightenment. Siddhartha gazed at the star and exclaimed out of deep compassion. All beings contain within themselves the seeds of enlightenment, and yet we drown in the ocean of birth and death for so many thousands of lifetimes. Siddhartha knew he had found the great way. He had attained his goal, and now his heart experienced perfect peace and ease. He thought about his years of searching, filled with disappointments and hardships. He thought of his father, his mother, aunt, Yasudhara, Rahula and all his friends. He thought of the palace, his people and country and all of those who lived in hardship and poverty especially children. He promised to find a way to share his discovery, to help all others liberate themselves from suffering. Out of his deep insight emerged a profound love for all beings. Along the grassy river bank, colorful flowers blossomed in the early morning sunlight Sun danced on leaves and sparkled on the water. His pain was gone. All the wonders of life revealed themselves. Everything appeared strangely new. How wondrous were the blue skies and drifting white clouds. He felt as though he and all the universe had been newly created. Just then, Svasti appeared. When Siddhartha saw the young buffalo boy come running towards him, he smiled. Suddenly, Svasti stopped in his tracks and stared at Siddhartha, his mouth wide open. Siddhartha called, Svasti! The boy came to his senses and answered, Teacher! Svasti joined his palms and bowed. He took a few steps forward, but then stopped and gazed again at Siddhartha in awe. Embarrassed by his own behaviour, he spoke haltingly. 
Teacher, you look so different today. Siddhartha motioned for the boy to approach. He took him into his arms and asked, how do I look different today? Gazing up at Siddhartha, Svasti answered, it's hard to say, it, it, it's just that you look so different. It's like, like you were a star. Siddhartha patted the boy on the head and said, is that so? What else do I look like? You look like a lotus that's just blossomed and like, like the moon over the Gaia Sissa peak. Siddhartha looked into Svasti's eyes and said, why, you are a poet, Svasti. Now tell me, why are you here so early today? And where are your buffaloes? Svasti explained that he had the day off as all the buffaloes were being used to plough the fields. Only the calf had been left in its stall. Today, his only responsibility was to cut grass. During the night, he and his sisters and brother were awakened by the roar of thunder. Rain pounded through their leaky roof, soaking their beds. They had never experienced a storm so fierce, and they worried about Siddhartha in the forest. They huddled together until the storm subsided and then could fall back asleep. When day broke, Svasti ran to the buffalo stall to fetch his sickle and carrying pole and made his way to the forest to see if Siddhartha was all right. Siddhartha grasped Svasti's hand. This is the happiest day I have ever known. If you can, bring all the children to come and see me by the pipala tree this afternoon. Don't forget to bring your brothers and sisters. But first go and cut the kusa grass you need for the buffaloes. Svasti trotted off happily as Siddhartha began to take slow steps along the sun-bathed shore. Dear friends, this is where we pause in our story. Please go gently. Cheerio for now. <laughs>